welcome to Writers Read. We get together we get together another time to hear two writers read and today Bob Anderson and Nancy McReynolds are going to read their writing. And first of all, you know the routine. I say a line and you say a line with Paul Lee Banks poem. Are you ready? Write, write, write. Write, write, write. Until you get it right. Until you get it right. Then read aloud. Then, then read aloud. aloud. You'll draw a crowd. You'll draw a crowd. And bring us great delight. And bring us great delight. Oh, I like starting this that way every single time. Sounds good. It sounds good, Bob, doesn't it? Hi, Bob. It's good to see you again. I'm remembering the first time you read about your job at Boeing. Yes. And I was just amazed by the detail and what you had to do on the job. But we have talked a little bit about how much writing is involved in your job. But tell me how you got started with this later chapter, with this later writing. All right. I, uh, I worked for Boeing for 37 years. And I worked for the same thing, flight tests, most of, uh, all of the time, in fact. Mm. And we didn't have to talk any. We Our work was written, and uh, oh. that was it. <laughs> and so at about, uh, I don't know what time it was, I changed jobs, and I went to Ronald Reagan's Star Wars airplane, and then I had to talk. And my first thing, I was so terrified, I don't know what I did. It was just terrible. I had to get up in front of a whole room full of people. I haven't done that since I had a book report, you know, when I was in high school. <laughs> and I didn't sleep for that oh, week. My. Anyway, um, and I'd never written anything to speak of. Uh, my, all my writing was done with entries, uh, telling the shop what to do on the airplane. And that would be about this much. Mm -hmm. And then I got the job as working on that plane and I found I had to write and I couldn't well I could but I hadn't written anything because my job was as instrumentation I put things on the airplane and I worked with a man that needed me to, to talk and to, I didn't do that and I had never written so I started writing and he started correcting and finally, I realized I was going to have to write. So I started and I worked through that part of the program. And by the time I finished, I was pretty fair. I could weasel word with the best of them. <laughs> anyway, I retired in 1995. And I thought that I would, at one point, I would write a book about what I did. And Mainly, I wrote it for the other 30 people that did the same job I did, and there were about 100 and some of us in wow. this instrumentation group, mm -hmm. and we were part of that. And we worked on all the test airplanes, and you could pick any one of us and put him any, on any of the airplanes, and we would, he would be competent to do immediately what he did on that. only difference was the size of the airplane. So. I sat down and I started writing on this book, on the, well, a, uh, the Dash 80 came back from um, the desert where they had it stored and they were going to give it to the Smithsonian. So we went down to correct the air, you know, to greet the airplane and it came in and Tex Johnson who flew it was flying and uh, he was on the airplane and it was great. and. They made a big deal out of it, and about uh, two weeks later when they wrote it up, they said that anybody that has Dash 80 stories, send them in to oh us. My. So I was sitting there, and I thought, gosh, I've got, got a few Dash 80 stories. So I, I uh, wrote a few of them up, and then I didn't know where to send them because I, he hadn't told me, and I had forgotten, and I couldn't find it. And so here I am with what I'd written. And I suddenly realized that I was 
working on the edge of the uh, jet airplane program in the, in the world mm -hmm. with the Dash 80 and the uh, this was during the time when the 707s were coming up oh. and they were big and I didn't start writing anything then and then I was assigned to the 747 the number oh. one 747 and I worked on the program for that for the full time I flew on the airplane I was part of the test crew and this went on, and I worked on the 767 and the 777 and retired. And after I retired, I began thinking about the Dash 80 and what he had said about the, you know, uh, uh, do, do what you do. And I thought, I've got a lot of stuff here for the entire Boeing airplanes. The B-52s I worked on, the KC-135, 707, 727, 374, 757, 67, and 77. <laughs> Got it down. And I've only done a, few, a couple of very small jobs on the 37 and on the 57. But on the wide bodies, I was assigned to Everett. And I was the factory representative for flight test in Everett as the airplanes were being built. And then I came out of the uh, factory with the 747 as part of the flight crew on that and on the 767. And then I stayed in the factory on the 77 until it got out. And when it was certified, I retired. Oh, my. And after I retired, I started writing this book because I, 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 I decided to make it a book. Good. And Good. so. I started uh, with the B-52s, okay. and I kept going B-52, yeah. KC, and everything <laughs> through that until I finished. And I don't know, that's about it. That's wonderful. What are we going to hear today? Well, <laughs> I uh, when I started this thing, I wrote about my my uh, experiences, and that was that was actually, actually, um, what's the word? I can't think of words anymore. Yeah. Fact, true fact, because it happened to me. Yeah. But if I started anything else, I decided to decide. I discovered it had to be fiction. Oh. <laughs> and so, if you're writing fiction, you're you're making it up as you go along. Uh, but I never done that. Yeah. And I thought, well, you know, I shouldn't be too hard. The first question that popped up, what are you going to write about? And I didn't know. I couldn't write about any sequel to what I had done because I wasn't there anymore. So I finally decided I would write a Western. Oh, because there are wonderful. thousands of books and thousands of movies about Westerns, yes. and I can do that. So I, when I was a uh, I started reading westerns when I was about 13 years old. My yeah. uncle bought me a copy of Red Rider and His mm -hmm. Horse Something the Other. And I read that and I didn't think too much of that. And so I bought a book from the Methodist Church sale and it was called Pistol Passport and by Eugene Cunningham and I wrote read that and that was a very good book I mean just as a not only as a Western but a good book and so I decided well I could write that but you've got to have as I discovered a lot of plain facts behind what you're oh, writing because sure. otherwise people won't if you keep saying uh, so and so did this um, they wonder what happened to so and so. So when I started writing this, I decided I would I would have a write a story about a young boy who's captured by Indians and and taken to whatever that is. But he had to have a mentor, and his mentor was going to be a woman, and she had to be captured by Indians. And so here's a problem right away. I don't know anything about what they do. So I started out with a woman and had to write a history of her from where oh she was goodness. born to where she oh came my. out there because I had to get her out to Texas yes. somehow and I had to, had to make it 
reasonable. Well, we better, we better get started on the story. <laughs> well, I tell you, it's going to be hard because I had a thing here to tell you oh, about. Oh, okay. But I can say this is a part of a story about a boy and a woman. And the woman is taking a trip. She's escaping from home. She is a, what's the word, uh, a lady uh, uh, a lady who hasn't been around much. Can't think of the word for that. Anyway, she's uh, about five feet one. She weighs about uh, 100 pounds, maybe. And she's very plain. She has no beauty at all, but she's not ugly. She's just plain. So she's captured. And it's, that's, that's bad because when, she, when you're captured, I won't bother going into all of this stuff, but you're treated like a dog, quite frankly, and you're made to lose all of your self-respect. And then they take you there from where you are and build you back up to what they want. And the Indians, the Comanches, have men, women, and children in the family, and they have horses. And the men do one thing, they fight and they uh, hunt game. And the women and the children do everything else. And they have slaves helping them. And when you go in there, you go in as a slave. And this part about men, she is captured, and I don't go into that in this part, it's just how she starts how she gets to Texas, and that's all, nothing oh, else. Wow. And then there's sections with Texas, sections with her school, where, I mean, where she started out. And I've got 77,000 words and 136 oh. pages. <laughs> oh, oh, good, you'll have to come back, that means. Well, can I say one more thing, okay. and then I'll start. I read a book, I, came, I went to see Elmore Leonard, when he was here in town. Oh, Somebody yeah. asked him how he wrote his books. And he said, well, I tell who's going, what, if I decide what the book is about, and then I find out who is going to be in the book, and then I follow them. And that's how I write the book. Oh, I my. follow the characters. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know what I was doing that, so the minute I started writing from that point on, I started out that way. And so that's how this is. Oh, wonderful, Bob. Are you ready? Yes. yes. Okay. Looking forward. Now this is Min. She is a lady and she's gotten from New York City to uh, Kansas or someplace. The driver stopped his rig opposite an opening in the wall of trees that ran parallel to the road. Turning to his passenger, he said apologetically, like I said, ma'am, uh, this is as close as I can get you to on from this side. The holding place for Kennedy's wagon train is a minute on the far side of that stand of trees. He gestured at the trees beside them, about a quarter mile. There's a god-awful deep gully with a creek at the bottom. Runs through there with a little bitty footbridge over it, stops all buggies crossing from this here side. I dasn't leave the rig, but I can wait with you for a spell till maybe somebody else shows up and can help you with your bags. Lots of people come this way, he contended with a hopeful expression, which she interpreted correctly. Thank you, Mr. Jen, she said, but that won't be necessary. I packed my bags with situations like this in mind, she continued as she dismounted. As she opened her purse, she removed two carpet bags from the rig, placed them on the ground beside her. There's some peeled logs on the way there you can sit on if you get tired, he called after her, as she picked up the bags and disappeared into the trees. She crossed the narrow bridge, pausing for a minute moment to gaze at the rushing water 15 feet below her, then quickened her pace as the trees began to thin out ahead of her making the end of her 1,200-mile journey. She passed through the trees and stopped in a small bare clearing, staring in amazement that expanse that Mr. Jin said turned a meadow. A distant green line pushed out from the trees to her left, defining the path of the creek she had crossed. It moved diagonally away and then turned in a swooping arc to move across the meadow nearly opposite to where she stood, before turning again at an oblique angle to receive in what appeared to be a straight line toward the far hills, which were dimly visible 
through the low haze. Mr. Jen's meadow was probably measured in square miles, she decided. She turned to her right, looking for the continuation of the water, but its path was concealed in the trees. The wind that had accompanied her through the trees lessened and then died away, and she became aware of familiar sounds. The neighing of a horse, the clang of metal on metal, the calls and cries of children. It was all spread out in front of her. She saw the wagons there, dozens of them. They were scattered out in every conceivable direction in no apparent order, as if they had been dropped from the sky and had struck where they landed. Horses were tethered in different parts of several wagons and on her shared by two cows. At least over a dozen children under 10 years old played their games among, among them, supplemented by half that number of older siblings tending to their parents' bidding. The metered ring of metal on metal announced the presence of a blacksmith to initiate an ear. The women stood, women stood singly or in various groups conversing and or watching children. Her gaze finally stopped on the only visible permanent structure. A small stone house, actually more shed than house, sat about a hundred feet away. The side facing her contained a door and one window and a plume of smoke trailed upward from a stubby stone chimney. Two horses were tied in a hitching rail off to the side of the door while their owners engaged in a complete discussion with raised voices and exaggerated gesticulations. Retrieving the two bags she had dropped unknowingly, she followed a well-defined path leading through the lush grass toward the house. As she drew near, the man facing her glanced at her for a moment, but otherwise gave no indication that she was approaching. He was the taller of the two by at least a head, wearing a broad-brimmed hat pushed back and showing a wide expanse of white forehead. The sharp demarcation mark between the dark tan of the lower part of it and his face apparent was apparent even at a distance. His clothing was typical except that he appeared to be wearing slippers of some type rather than shoes. His companion was shorter but wider and similarly dressed with his trousers tucked into boots. As she came within earshot, the smaller man waving it was waving a handful of roll papers and shouted, Damn it all to hell, Harry, I don't care if that asshole is over hung over. I don't give a damn if he's puking his guts out. You go see him and you by God tell him to move off his dead ass and get the hell over here. That goddamn Don is on his way here now. Now, and by God, he sure as hell good for three wagons, got at least two dozen prime horses, and I can't understand a word he says, and I don't trust him as far as I can throw his skinny ass. I've got to have Sanchez here to tell me what the hell he's mumbling about. The woman stopped just behind him and stood quietly watch, waiting for him to finish. He had drawn a deep breath, but before he could continue his tirade, the tall man spoke. Uh, Matt, we got company. I think the lady behind you wants to talk to one of us. The short man drew in another breath, swallowed once, and turned around to face the woman. He looked her up and down for a long moment. He saw a small woman, thin to the point of emaciation, dressed in a light brown traveling dress with a marching, matching straw hat and holding a carpet bag in each hand. He nodded once and then said in a normal voice, I'm Matthew Kinsey, feller behind me is Harry Ketchum. Who are you and what do you want? She located a spot clear of grass and carefully set her bags to the ground. I am Minerva Jean Hoskins, she said, from New York and Boston by way of St. Louis. I learned about your proposed trip to the West and I want to go with you. I have, Kimsey interrupted her, waving the sheet of papers in his hand. He said, says right here on page one of these papers, page three, what you need to make a trip. He sorted through the stack, removed a single sheet, and began to read. Wagon with spare kingpin and wheel. Healthy team of horses capable of pulling loaded wagon. Two water barrels. Food enough for he stopped reading and looked at her. You got all that for starters? I don't see it anywhere. He asked, looking around at the uh, clearing. Of course not, she said. Everything I own is in these two bags. <laughs> Then how the hell do you plan on making the trip, he said hardly. Don't swear, she said grimly. It doesn't become you. I hope to earn my passage. 
How, he asked, just short of a shout. I'm a nanny, she said, and a good one. The statement stopped him cold. Nanny? He repeated, a bewildered expression on his face. He turned to his companion and read the word nanny. No idea, Matt, said the other man with a shrug. <laughs> oh, for goodness sake, she exclaimed, stamping her foot. A nursemaid, if you must. I take care of children. I teach them. Take them off the parents' hands during the day. There must be several families here who would be overjoyed to have such service on a trip such as this. That's why I came to see you first, Mr. Kinsey. You know, again, he was interrupted by this time by Henry Harry. Matthew, he said, we got more company. Looks like he brought the pup along, too. Kinsey and the woman had both turned around. There were three men were approaching. The lead horse was coal black, and its rider, a tall, slender man, attired in, entirely in black, black shirt, black trousers, black boots, and a heavy black sombrero, which was liberally de decorated with silver conchos. He wore a small mustache and a goatee, both of which were gray. The second horse and rider were almost exact replicas of the leader, except the leader, the rider, was much younger, and his black uh, uh, apparel sported silver wherever it was impossible. Mm -hmm. He also wore a small mustache. Minerva decided that, that was the pup that Ketchum had referred to. <laughs> a third rider, a short distance behind them, the first two, wore a coarse brown robe and was mounted on a donkey. The three men dismounted and the two men in black handed their reins to the third man and all three moved toward them, the man in the row bringing up the rear leading horses. Minerva quickly turned to her companion. Mr. Ketchum, have you met these men? No, he answered. Mr. Kinsey, what is the older gentleman's name? Don Roberto Escobar, why? She did not answer but turned to face the men who were now approaching. The three men had stopped and Don Roberto was scanning them with a puzzled look. He cleared his throat, but before he could speak, Minerva stepped forward and asked in fluent Spanish, Senor, you are Don Roberto Escobar? He nodded and started to speak again, but she continued, I am Senorita Minerva Hoskins, Senor Sanchez, who unable, was unable to join us today, so I am Senor Kennedy's voice and ears. She turned back to her companions, explained what she had said, and asked that it appeared that additional introductions were necessary, and asked if she, had initi if she should initiate them. The question was rhetorical, but it gave her companions time to recover from their confusion at the sudden turn of events. She and Don Escobar proceeded to work through their instruction, our introductions of the remaining members of both the group parties. How may we be of service to you, she asked, after the anemones were completed. Don Roberto replied that several items required clarification, and he would appreciate their help. Uh, Minerva informed Kenzie, and the discussion began with Minerva standing between Escobar and Kenzie, with Kenzie aligned alongside, with Ketchum aligned alongside Kenzie, and the younger Spaniard besides Don Roberto. As she was translating one of their quests, she noticed that the man in the brown robe had ground hits the mounts and had edged forward until he was almost inconspicuously joining the group. When she had finished the translation, she turned to catch him, and without a break in her dis dis dissertation, said, Mr. Ketchum, oh, I hate this. Oh, yeah. Oh, here we go. Could you verify the possible modification on page three that we were discussing with these gentlemen arrived? Ketchum stared blankly at her for a moment before he could answer Kinsey, who had taken a full step ahead, thumbed through the papers in his hand, and passed one to her. She had shifted so that she faced Ketchum and Kinsey with her back to the three Spaniards. After perusing the paper for several seconds, she passed it to Ketchum, saying in a voice to carry in all five men, Mr. Ketchum, and added in a low voice, audible only to the two Americans, the uh, man in the robe has probably understands English. Be careful what you say to each other. Pup, 
Mr. Ketchum, who is now caught up and handed the paper back to Kenzie, saying, no changes. Kenzie said, nothing has changed. Pass that along to Don Roberto, if it matters. Commerce, Minerva nodded, turned around, and then the discussion was concluded after several more questions and answers. The two men shook hands with the Americans, bowed to Minerva, mounted their animals, and rode off. Mm. The man in the brown rode grayly. Oh, my God. Ah, oh, good for you. Whoa, said Kinsey, turning to Minerva. That was <laughs> exciting. Do you speak anything else along with Spanish? I speak, read, and write both Spanish and Spanish. I also are both French and Spanish. I also speak a little German, but I haven't had many opportunities to practice. <laughs> Kinsey nodded. We meet a lot of French traders on our way west, so that'll come in handy. I guess there's a place for you if you want to go, she nodded. I do. Kinsey let out a long breath and turned to catch him. Now we got to find a place to put her. The nanny bit sounds like our best bet. Let's see. Try the Eplings, the Bartons, and the Jinx. They all have kids about that right age. He turned back to her. Five, six, seven years. Is that okay? Good, Matthew. And me sleep in the cook's wagon whenever we sleep indoors, which ain't often. And that won't do for you. Mostly we roll up in blankets under the wagon. Being able to move out quick is more important than comfort. Besides, Cookie snores like a thunderstorm. <laughs> You'll pay your passage by talking, so whatever you can get for a man yank is found money. Just make sure they understand that room and board is part of what they're paying for. He turned back to catch him. Take her around now and let's get... Why? Oh. Ah. It started. It settled. See the Bartons first. And then give her uh, my come to God speech on the way over. <laughs> Put her bags in the house for now. He unhitched his horse, mounted and rode away, leaving Minerva and Ketchum looking at each other. Mm -hmm. That was quick, Minerva said. Yep, said Ketchum. That's how he is. Far as he's concerned, it's done. Now we got to go make it happen. Well, let's put your bags in that shanty and get on with it, but first let's take a look at your shoes. She started to object, hesitated, then raised her skirts carefully, a calibrated four inches, exposing <laughs> two sturdy low heel brown shoes that terminated just above her ankles. Ketchum studied them for a moment, then nodded in approval. Good, he said. Those will do. You'll do as much walking as riding, and you'll need all the help you can get. How long you been talking Spanish? Since I was about four or five, I think, she said. Is there anything else you want to know? Uh, any brothers, fathers, husbands, or boyfriends liable to be showing up here looking for you, he asked. You got to understand, I ain't being nosy. You're part of this company now, and a lot's going to depend on you being able to talk to an awful lot of people. He passed, looking over her shoulder. Well, hello, here comes Sanchez. I'll just send him back to the remota. Now, take a few minutes, but this is best to do it now. Anyway, give it some thought, and while I take care of that horse and your bags, let me know if anything comes to mind. Minerva watched Ketchum as he moved to interpret the intercept, intercept the rider. Well, yes, thought Minerva. Something else comes to mind, but is it relevant? It has to do somewhat with the question about Spanish, uh, and actually it was a small fib, but the question about brother, not as small, but did it matter? She was a late arrival in her family, very, very late. Her brother Charles, who was the only child to date, her mother was 30 when he was born, and she was 13 when Minerva made her unexpected appearance. Her parents had looked forward to the advent of the new family member, and her father especially was enchanted with the debut, deb, debut of a baby girl, but Charles was not. He enjoyed his position as the only child and actually resented the usurper. Uh, but he was clever enough to hide his hostility from his parents. Having stowed the bags and attended to the horse, Ketchum returned and started across the meadow following it, a clearly defined path that terminated at several of the wagons. 
About your, concess, your question concerning visitors I might have, Minerva began, I have heard, uh, I've been thinking, and I believe that my brother might qualify. How so? Well, when I left, I took something of mine that he'll probably want. What? A bag of gold coins, uh, rather a partial deleted bag of gold coins, depleted bag of gold coins. It was supposed to be my dowry, but my brother has been using it for his own purpose. They continued walking around the distance wagons for a short distance, then Ketchum stopped and asked, uh, where were you living and how long have you been gone? New York City in about three months. It took that long to get here. I originally intended to continue on to New Orleans on the riverboat, but I overheard some men talking about the West Wagon trains to Santa Fe, so that sounded better and I left the boat in St. Louis. I used another name, Sarah Osgood, on the trip here, she added. Catch him ruminated for a good two minutes. Well, he finally said, I figure that you're safe enough he is more than likely still poking around New York City. We'll be on our way in a couple of days, and the only ones who heard you and your name will be with us. I ain't going to bother Matt with this. He grinned at her. Anybody shows up looking for Ms. Oddgood will bundle you up in a feed sack and stow you in one of the wagons till they leave. Let's forget about it. She, Thank you, she said. They walked for a few more minutes in silence. What's this about a come to God speech, Mr. Kinsey mentioned? Oh yeah, yeah, he replied, forgot about that. Well, that's the speech Matthew, Matthew gives to all the people making the trip. Matthew's got two speeches, one for them that works with, for us and one for them that's paying customers. Kind of a good news, bad news thing. Which speech do I, speech do I get? <laughs> Sorry about no, that. No, sorry. It's just the way it is. They just get stuck together. Oh. Well, I need that talk. Yes, you need the talk. Matter of fact, why don't you just hand them to me? Oh. Is okay. that the one you need? Yeah, I need the next one. This yeah. one is, I'll take the bowl for a Upside well, Ketchum says, I got only one. That's the one for the hired hands, and I reckon you qualify. That's the first two. Woman, that is. The good news is it will get there in about eight, ten weeks. The bad news is it will probably lose some things along the way. Things like wagons, horses, and people. Most folks don't pay much attention to that part. They figure bad things happen to somewhere, someone else, not them. When you say lose, what do you mean exactly? Horse, wagons get wrecked, horses get lost or stolen, and people get lost, die or die or get stolen. Also, there's what man you, Matthew calls the locals. I don't understand. What you have said sounds like uh, what one would expect on a trip of this kind. Matthew does a pretty good job of covering all the possibilities. Talks about wrecked wagons, lost or stolen horses, and people dying. Natural dying, like a flu, old age, heart trouble, and things like snake bite and falling off a horse or drowning, things like that. What he don't cover is stolen. He tells how men in, in the private, but doesn't talk about it when the women and children can hear. Leaves it up to the men to pass on whatever part they want to, but he tells it like it is. He don't water it down any. But then Minerva stopped and looked at him, facing him. But you're going to tell me about what he tells the men, too, aren't you? It was a statement, not a question. Sure am, he said. Like you, like I said, you're part of the company now. Of course, you can quit any time you want to, uh, if, you, if you don't like what you read, what you hear. Your choice. Fair enough, she said. What are the locals? I didn't think we stopped in very many towns. Ketchum grinned. We don't, he said. Locals are what Matthew calls the different Indian tribes we run into. Not on to a dozen twixt here in Santa Fe. A strange way to refer to them, she said. What are they? He calls them locals because he said they were here first. 
Now let's see, there's Arapahoes, Cheyennes, Delawares, Kickapoos, Osages, Shawnees, Cherokees, some Apaches scattered around Comanches and a few others. I've heard of a few of them. I understand that some of them can be dangerous. They all can be dangerous, but the Comanches are the ones we got to worry about. I understand the Apaches were the worst. We've got to pass through a large section of the country, nearly 200 miles, called the Comanchero. The Comanchero, the, Com the Comanches own it. Give you one guess as to who used to own it and who got chased out. The Apaches, she said. Good guess. Before we have always followed the Santa Fe Trail down the Arkansas River to the Lois Crossing, down to the Cimarron River to the McNeese Crossing into Santa Fe, this time we got a problem. What's the problem, she asked dutifully. Horses, he said succinctly. Horses? Don't you always have horses? Not like these. Remember Matthew said he figured to don for a couple of dozen horses? Well, he advertised this trip as a chance to take blood horses to Santa Fe. Lots of money there waiting for the right shock stock. Hit a nerve too. We got four others not counting the Don. They all know the risks and hired extra hands for the trip. But there's others, family types, making the trip, and that's what worries them. I don't understand the problem, and like you've got taken care of almost anything that might happen. She studied him for a moment. Does it have something to do with Miss what Mr. Kinsey tells the men? Yep, I think it probably does. I guess I got to tell you something. Matthew knows, but he's the only one that does. I'd like you to keep it to yourself. She nodded. I can do that. <laughs> they had been walking along a well-defined dirt road and nearly reached the designated wagon. So let's stop here for a spell, he said, sitting action to words. Well, he continued, last year I was traveling, or not years ago, I was traveling west across the Arkansas, same place we're going, in fact, and I happened on an Indian. Horse had stepped in a hole and rolled over on him, banged him up pretty bad. Horse was still standing there on three legs when I come up. Brave just lying there, couldn't move, although he could see he'd been trying to reach the horse. I put the horse down and put him, the brave, to back together as best I could. He was Comanche, and he, we were parked uh, pretty much along the north edge of the Comanchero. I figured I rigged a riding Travis and got him on it. It must have hurt pretty bad, but he never let out so much as a peep. Mm -hmm. We couldn't talk, but managed to sign enough, so I knew he was part of a raiding party, which same raiding party caught up with us the next day. He was out cold when they got here, and it was touch and go for a few minutes, but I had put all of his weapons with him on the, on the Travis, and that counted in my favor. He come to and explained what had happened, and they had prisoners and somebody else's horses with them, so they allowed us how I'd better come along. If any of the other locals they had just visited called up with us, it might not go down so good. It seemed like a good idea at the time, so I went. Stayed for about two years, in fact. Took three days to get back to their main camp. We didn't stop once to light a fire. If there had been a full moon, I don't think we'd have stopped at all to sleep, except that the horses needed to eat. When we got there, I had another unpleasant surprise waiting for me. I always figured I was as good or better with the horses than almost anybody in, all, in almost all the hands I worked with. In this camp, I found boys whose voices were still changing knew more than I did. Lots more. Girls, too. Really puts a man down a peg or two. <laughs> Ketchum shook his head at the memory and looked inquiringly at Minerva, who nodded. What little bit of history. The Dons bought two things to the tribes, religion and horses. Too much of the first and none of the second. <laughs> for the rest, for the Indians, the work of farming and mining went with the religion, and the Dons made sure nobody but themselves had any horses. Finally, one of the tribes got fed up with the arrangement and evened things up by killing all the Dons in their village. The horses got away and ran free. The horses started breeding, and the Dons started moving out of the villages. That's it. Uh, there's more to that, but it's not Oh, yet. we can't wait for the wow. next reading. That was just wonderful. Thank you so much. I wanted to warn you.
but it wasn't exciting. The, the, it is uh, pretty exciting. Oh, <laughs> your descriptions were yeah. wonderful, Bob. Thank you I had so fun much. With those. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Hi, Nancy. Welcome, welcome to Writers Read. I'm still recovering from your story about being at the University of Washington with your father. And so I'm really looking forward to your next story. What are you going to read today, Nancy? Well, this one includes both my mother and father. Oh, good. And it was written 60 years ago for my parents' 50th wedding anniversary. Oh, Nancy, this is wonderful. <laughs> okay. You want me to go ahead? Yes. All right. <coughs> mother and Dad. This is your life. You met at Westbrook Seminary in Portland, Maine, where Mother, Josephine Mary Stanley, was a boarding student, and Dad, William Harriman Drew, was a day student. The school still stands, but is now a women's junior college. Dad was quite an athlete, playing both football and basketball. Mother wasn't a star, but she played on the girls' basketball team. She was also active in debate and dramatics. At graduation, Mother was a commencement speaker and salutatorian of her class. You were married by the Reverend Ransom Gilkey on January 15, 1912, in Mother's parents' new home in Dixfield, Maine. There was a blizzard that day, and Dad's mother, who lived in Portland, Maine, was unable to attend the wedding. You went to Boston on your honeymoon and stayed at Mother's, Aunt Nellie and Uncle Dick's home in Newtonville, Massachusetts. Following your marriage, you lived in Mother's parent, with Mother's parents. Your first child, Mary Stanley, was born at home on November 26, 1912. You then moved to Portland, Maine, where Dad sold real estate for the Fidelity Trust Company. Your second child, George Stanley, was born at home on September 29, 1915. While living in Portland, you often went on picnics to Old Orchard Beach on Sunday afternoons. In April 1917, the United States entered World War I and Dad joined the Army. He was a member of the 51st Pioneer Infantry. Mother and the children went back to Dixfield to live with Mother's parents. Dad was stationed at various camps up and down the East Coast and then finally boarded the USS Orizaba to be shipped overseas. He was stationed in France and fought in the famed Battle of the Argonne. On November 11, 1918, the armistice was signed and Dad was selected to serve in the Presidential Guard Company. One of your treasured possessions is an autographed pop picture of President Wilson given to you by Mrs. Wilson mm -hmm. when Dad served as a guard at the Presidential Headquarters at Versailles during the Peace Conference. Mm -hmm. Dad accompanied President Wilson back to New York on the USS George Washington. Dad immediately went to Dixfield to be reunited with his family. Dad was carrying a silk blouse he had purchased in Paris for Mother, <laughs> which now resides at the Museum of History and Industry, and navy blue regulation coats for each of the children. The family then moved to Tenafly, New Jersey, where Dad was stationed at Camp Merritt. Trips into New York were a highlight for the family, as were the special events at the Post. There was a surplus in the camp's entertainment fund, as a result, vaudeville acts from New York were hired to put on shows on the outdoor theater. To spend the balance of the fund, the entire camp went to Coney Island with free tickets for everything. <laughs> Next year, family boarded a train for the Wild and Woolly West when Dad was transferred to Camp Dodge near Des Moines, Iowa. You lived on the post in converted barracks. It was here that the Red Cross issued the family a player piano mm. and beds complete with bedbugs. 
<laughs> in a short time, literature began to arrive from the Tacoma Chamber of Commerce, and the entire 4th Division boarded troop, tra troop trains bound for Camp Lewis, now Joint Base Lewis-McCord, Washington. You lived in camp for a while and then decided to rent a house off base at American Lake. Each morning, Dad and Mary walked to Camp Murray, a National Guard camp adjacent to Camp Lewis, for Dad to go to work and Mary to attend school. They rode to Camp Lewis either on an army bus or a local jitney known as the Hurdy Gurdy. <laughs> the family enjoyed trips to Seattle on the steamer, Seattle, or the Indianapolis. Mm -hmm. Chinese dinners at Green Park were another treat. About this time, King, half husky and half collie, joined the family. When Dad was discharged from the Army, you came to Seattle to live and Dad went to work for H.J. Hines Company. You lived on West Alaska Street in West Seattle. Dad walked a mile to the streetcar each morning carrying a sample case with Heinz 57 varieties and a wooden bucket of pickles. <laughs> Next, you moved from West Seattle to Queen Anne Hill, 2519 2nd Avenue West to be exact. Dad made business trips to Alaska. While he was away, Mother learned to drive and had her hair bobbed. <laughs> Dad wasn't too pleased. <laughs> Your first automobile was a Ford touring car bought at the Canal Motor Company. Your first trip in it was to Vancouver, BC. This was a two-day trip each way with no pavement beyond Blaine, Washington. Mm -hmm. It was on a camping trip to Pacific Beach in Grace Harbor, Harbor County that Dad found Mother's new hat under his bedroll in the morning. <laughs> you took a trip to California and went as far south as San Jose. Many Sunday afternoons were spent on picnics with your friends the Grays and the Sunborgs, grandparents of the Reverend Stephen Sunborg, former president of Seattle University. In the very early 1920s, mother's parents made their first automobile trip from Maine to Seattle, the first of 14 such trips, and they always stayed for the winter. In 1925, you decided to move back to the East Coast. You drove east via the Yellowstone Highway, the first transcontinental automobile highway through the upper tier of states in the United States, camping all the way. You had coast to coast written on the side of your car. <laughs> you went first to Dixfield and then moved to West Newton, Massachusetts. Dad went to work for Libby McNeil and Libby, and you started saving immediately to move back to Seattle. <laughs> William Harriman was born in Boston on March 6, 1926. Mm -hmm. By September 1926, you had saved enough money for the family to board a train the Olympian for the trip back to Seattle, bringing the dog King in the, ba in the baggage car. Oh. You rented a house at 312 West McCross Place and bought our first Chevrolet. Chevrolet. It was black, the only color manufactured. <laughs> Dad took great pride in keeping it polished as he did all his cars. Shortly after returning to Seattle, Dad went to work for the California Packing Corporation. Immediately, we all became addicted to Del Monte brand canned goods. I haven't, we have never changed. When you bought your present home at 2411 Third Avenue West, Dad and Mary moved you, what Dad called Irish method. That means moving yourself <laughs> through the backyard. John Nickerson was born June 9, 1928. Next along came Jean Louise on February 16, 1930. Your family was complete with the birth of Nancy Joyce on August 18, 1936. Things were lean during the Depression years, but your New England thriftiness helped you get by. When money became a little more plentiful in the late 1930s, there were several trips to California to visit your good friends, the Wilbers, in Las Gatas. 
1939, George joined the United States Coast Guard and the rest of the family got ice skating fever. Everyone was on the ice, even the two of you. Mother was busy taking us for lessons and making skating costumes, while Dad varnished the soles of our skating boots, which never seemed to quite get dry. Nancy and Jean took up figure skating, John and Bill played hockey, and Mary enjoyed ice dancing. In 1946, we decided to spend our Sunday mornings at St. Paul's Episcopal Church instead of at the Civic Ice Arena. The two of you, John, Jean, and Nancy, were all baptized and confirmed. Mary had been a member for some time. Ever since 1946, you have been a regular attenders and contributors to the church. Mother is a member of St. Mary's Guild and Dad has served on the vestry. Remember this was written 60 years yeah. ago. During World War II, the battlefronts were well covered with George serving in the Coast Guard on the Atlantic and Bill serving in the Navy on the Pacific. Many months went by when you didn't know where either of your sons were stationed because no mail was coming through. Mm -hmm. Letters that did get delivered often had censored information mm -hmm. cut out of them. Oh when gasoline became more plentiful in 1949, mother, John, Nancy, Jean, and Ross, Jean's boyfriend, drove to the <laughs> East Coast. John did the driving and Jean and Ross held hands. <laughs> there were two more automobile trips east, the last one being in the summer of 1954. You planned to reach Syracuse, New York in time to watch the Washington Huskies compete in crew races. Instead, the time was spent in Ogallala, Nebraska, having the car repaired. Oh, no. It took five days as the engine was sent to Grand Island, Nebraska by bus for repair. Oh, dear. Dad retired from the California Packing Corporation in July, on July 1, 1952, when Mother suggested that Dad find something to keep him out from underfoot. Dad decided to enter the University of Washington for fall quarter. For the next six years, Dad was busy studying Chaucer, Shakespeare, and Dickens as an English literature major. Dad found that one of the advantages of being a student was his athletic activities card. <laughs> the two of you could usually be found on the 50-yard line at f football games in the student section rooting for the Huskies. <laughs> However, college life wasn't all footballs and roses. Parrington Library became Dad's Aww. favorite hangout in which to study. Mm. Finally, Dad made it in June 1958. Dad graduated in, study com in style complete with the commencement exercises, a graduation party, and a front page spread on the Seattle Post Intelligencer. Oh my. Dad's writing ability that he had been developing over the years finally paid off. He entered a contest at your local IGA grocery store <laughs> and succeeded in writing a, in winning a 10 day all expense paid trip for two to the West Indies. In April 1958, Dad and Mother went first class to Miami Beach, Puerto Rico, and the Virgin Islands. What he wrote was about why better, butter was better than margarine. <laughs> oh. Meanwhile, mother in the meanwhile may not have earned a degree, but she certainly deserved one. Mm -hmm. She was constantly busy with doing everything from taking part in the PTA, serving dinners at the church, sewing for bazaars, helping us with our homework, serving as president of the Sigma Kappa Mothers Club, babysitting with grandchildren, keeping an eye on Chasey, the next door neighbor, as well as keeping her sewing machine going day and night. In addition, you have both been instrumental in shaping the lives of each of your children. Through your assistance and understanding, you share in our accomplishments. Each of your six children has seen success. Tonight, January 13, 1962, you are celebrating your golden wedding anniversary. You are dining at Overlake Golf and Country Club with your six children and their husbands and wives. We have looked back over the past 50 years 
and have recorded some very significant and memorable events. However, the true story can never be written down on paper, but has been recorded in the hearts and minds of each and every one of us. These are memories of picnic, picnics at Warm Beach, fried bread, a New England specialty, <laughs> you're helping us with our homework, you're phoning us each day to inquire when we're not feeling well, mother acting as a housekeeper and a nursemaid when each new baby is born, dad rocking the grandchildren we come to, when we come to visit, and many, many more. We appreciate your respecting our privacy, your unselfishness, your equal love, love for each of us, your impartiality with our children, your consistency and discipline, your concern when we have problems, your admiration for our achievements, your good sense of humor, your caring enough to know where we were and what we were doing, your high moral standards, and the courteous and respectful manner in which you conduct yourselves. This is the way we feel. We love you both very much. Mother and Dad, this is your life. Oh, Nancy, that makes me a little too Well, I was going to say, how did you get through that? Dear heart, did you read this at the event in 60? I did. They were right there. They were right there. And you read all of this. Mm -hmm. How did you get through it that time? <laughs> well, oh. I think there might have been a few tears there. Yeah, too, I bet but, so. Uh, uh, thank you, Nancy <laughs> McReynolds. <laughs> that was just <laughs> wonderful. Oh, that, very much. my. That was a wonderful history. Well, well, thank you. Yeah. And I'm so glad I did it. Yeah. Because it wasn't too long after that that my father died. Mm -hmm. oh. And, uh, you know, and if I didn't get it then, I was oh. never going to get it. Yeah, yeah. You got it. Yeah. Oh, this is just a treasure. And everybody in the family must have a copy. Oh, yes. Do Copies have gone to everybody. Oh. I mean, there's a plethora of us. <laughs> there's a lot, you know. Six children and Six all, all of the all offspring. <laughs> And, you know, now there are grandchildren, great-grandchildren, and great-greats. Yeah, great-greats. So. Oh, this is beautiful. Just filled me right up. Well, thank you. And Bob, thank you so much. Oh, okay. thank you. What, what an afternoon, Linda. <laughs> oh, this was rich, rich, rich. It always is. And we'll have to hear the next chapter in the West End. I'm looking forward to it. <laughs>